When I first went to Paris, I did so instead of returning to Pomona College for my junior year. As I looked around, it was Gothic architecture that impressed me most. And as that architecture, I preferred the flamboyant style of the 15th century. In this style, my interest was attracted by balustrades. These I studied for six weeks in the Bibliothèque Mazarine, getting into the library when the doors were opened and not leaving until they were closed. Professor Pogen, whom I had known at Pomona, arrived in Paris and asked me what I was doing. We were standing in one of the railway stations there. I told him. He gave me literally a swift kick in the pants and then said, go tomorrow to Goldfinger. I'll arrange for you to work with him. He's a modern ar architect. After a month of working with Goldfinger, measuring the dimensions of rooms which he was to modernize, answering the telephone and drawing Greek columns, I overheard Goldfinger saying to be an architect, one must devote one's life solely to architecture. I then left him, for as I explained, there were other things that interested me, music or painting, for instance. Five years later, when Schoenberg asked me whether I would devote my life to music, I said, of course. After I had been studying with him for two years, Schoenberg said, in order to write music, you must have a feeling for harmony. I explained to him that I had no feeling for harmony. He then said that I would always encounter an obstacle, that it would be as though I came to a wall through which I could not pass. I said, in that case, I will devote my life to beating my head against that wall. Artists talk a lot about freedom. So, recalling the expression, free as a bird, Morton Feldman went to a park one day and spent some time watching our feathered friends. When he came back, he said, you know, they're not free. They're fighting over bits of food. parcel of a way of life that puts trust in the almighty dollar so much that we feel ourselves slipping when we hear that on the international market the west german mark inspires more confidence food one of the international market assumes provides nourishment but americans eat it fully aware that small amounts of poison have been added to improve its appearance and delay its putrefaction None of us wants cancer or skin diseases, but there are those who tell us that's how we get them. It's hard to tell, come December, whether we're celebrating the birth of Christ or whether American business has simply pulled the wool over our eyes. When I hear that an artist whose work I admire gets $7,000 for a painting, whereas another whose work I don't admire gets twice as much, do I then change my mind? Ten years ago, the New York painters were for the most part poor as church mice. Did they then, or do they now, have a place in American society? There's a street in Stony Point in the lowland near the river where a number of species of mushrooms grow abundantly. I visit this street often. A few years ago in May, I found the morel there a choice mushroom which is rare around Rockland County. I was delighted. None of the people living on this street ever talk to me while I'm collecting mushrooms. Sometimes children come over and kick at them before I get to them. Well, the year after I found the morel, I went back in May expecting to find it again only to discover that a cinder block house had been put up where the mushroom had been growing. 
As I looked at the changed land, all the people in the neighborhood came out on their porches. One of them said, ha, ha, your mushrooms are gone. One day, I asked Schoenberg what he thought about the international situation. He said, the important thing to do is to develop foreign trade. Betty Isaacs told me that when she was in New Zealand, she was informed that none of the mushrooms growing wild there was poisonous. So one day, when she noticed a hillside covered with fungi, she gathered a lot and made catsup. When she finished the catsup, she tasted it and it was awful. Nevertheless, she bottled it and put it up on a high shelf. A year later, she was house cleaning and discovered the catsup which she had forgotten about. She was on the point of throwing it away, but before doing this, she tasted it. It had changed color. Originally a dirty gray, it had become black. And as she told me, it was divine, improving the flavor of whatever it touched. Once, when I was a child in Los Angeles, I went downtown on the streetcar. It was such a hot day that when I got out of the streetcar, the tar on the pavement stuck to my feet. I was barefoot. Getting to the sidewalk, I found it so hot that I had to run to keep from blistering my feet. I went into a five and dime to get a root beer. When I came to the counter where it was sold from a large barrel and asked for some, a man standing at the counter above me said, wait, I'm putting in the syrup and I'll be a few minutes. As he was putting in the last can, he missed and spilled the sticky syrup all over me. To make me feel better, he offered me a free root beer. I said, no, thank you. While we were sitting on top of Slide Mountain, looking out towards Coleman and Wittenberg and the Ashokan Reservoir beyond. Guy Nearing said he had known two women who were bitten by copperheads. They were just the same as before, he said, except they were a little more cranky. On one occasion, Schoenberg asked a girl in his class to go to the piano and play the first movement of a Beethoven sonata, which was afterwards to be analyzed. She said, it is too difficult, I can't play it. Schoenberg said, you're a pianist, aren't you? She said, Yes, he said, then go to the piano. She did. She had no sooner begun playing than he stopped her to say that she was not playing at the proper tempo. She said that if she played at the proper tempo, she would make mistakes. He said, play at the proper tempo and do not make mistakes. She began again 
and he stopped her immediately to say that she was making mistakes. She then burst into tears and between sobs explained that she had gone to the dentist earlier that day and that she'd had a tooth pulled out. He said, do you have to have a tooth pulled out in order to make mistakes? Betty Isaacs went shopping at Altman's. She spent all her money except her last dime, which she kept in her hand so that she'd have it ready when she got on the bus to go home and wouldn't have to fumble around in her purse since her arms were full of parcels and she was also carrying a shopping bag. Waiting for the bus. She decided to make sure she still had the coin. When she opened her hand, there was nothing there. She mentally retraced her steps, trying to figure out where she'd lost the dime. Her mind made up, she went straight to the glove department, and sure enough, there it was on the floor where she'd been standing. As she stooped to pick it up, another shopper said, I wish I knew where to go to pick money up off the floor. Relieved, Betty Isaacs took the bus home to the village. Unpacking her parcels, she discovered the dime in the bottom of the shopping bag. One day, down at Black Mountain College, David Tudor was eating his lunch a student came over to his table and began asking him questions. David Tudor went on eating his lunch. The student kept on asking questions. Finally, David Tudor looked at him and said, if you don't know, why do you ask? What can you do? I can take off my shoes. When David Tudor, Merce Cunningham, Carolyn and Earl Brown and I arrived in Brussels a year or so ago for programs at the World's Fair, we found out that Earl Brown's Indices was not going to be played since the orchestra found it too difficult. So putting two and two together, we proposed that Merce Cunningham and Carolyn Brown dance solos and duets for Merce Cunningham's Spring Weather and People, which is his title for Earl Brown's Indices, and that David Tudor play the piano transcription as accompaniment. With great difficulty, arrangements were made to realize this proposal. At the last minute, the authorities agreed. However, just before the performance, died and everything was cancelled. An Indian woman who lived in the islands was required to come to Juno to testify in a trial. After she had solemnly sworn to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, she was asked whether she had been subpoenaed. She said, yes, once on the boat coming over, and once in the hotel here in Juneau. One summer day, Merce Cunningham and I took eight children to Bear Mountain Park. The paths through the zoo were crowded. Some of the children ran ahead while others fell behind. Every now and then we stopped, gathered all the children together and counted them to make sure none had been lost. Since it was very hot and the children were getting difficult, we decided to buy them ice cream cones. This was done in shifts. While I stayed with some, Merce Cunningham took others, got them cones, and brought them back. I took the ones with the cones, he took those without. Eventually, all the children were supplied with ice cream. However, they got it all over their faces. So we went to a water fountain where people were lined up to get a drink, put the children in line, met to keep them there, and waited our turn. Finally, I knelt beside the fountain. Merce Cunningham turned it on. Then I proceeded one by one to wash the children's faces. While I was doing this, a man behind us in line said rather loudly, 
There's a washroom over there. I looked up at him quickly and said, where? And how did you know I was interested in mushrooms? It was a Wednesday. I was in the sixth grade. I overheard dad saying to mother, get ready. We're going to New Zealand Saturday. I got ready. I read everything I could find in the school library about New Zealand. Saturday came. Nothing happened. The project was not even mentioned that day or any succeeding day. Tudor and I went up to New Haven to do a television class for the New Haven State Teachers College. That college specializes in teaching by means of television. What they do is to make a tape, audio and visual, and then broadcast it a day later, early in the morning. In the course of my talking, I said something about the purpose of purposelessness. Afterwards, one of the teachers said to the head of the music department, how are you going to explain this to class next Tuesday? Anyway, we finished the TV business, drove back to the school, and I asked the teachers to recommend some secondhand bookstores in New Haven for David Tudor and me to visit. They did. A half an hour later, when we walked into one of the bookstores, the book dealer said, Mr. Tudor, Mr. Cage. I said, yes. He said, you're to call the State Teachers College. I did. They said the television class we had recorded had not been recorded at all. Apparently, someone forgot to turn something on. Then we had to go back to New Haven to do the TV class over again. This time, on the way back, it was very hot and humid day. We stopped again in Newtown, but at a different place or some ice. There was a choice. Raspberry, grape, lemon, orange, and pineapple. I took grape. It was refreshing. I asked the lady who served it whether she had made it. She said, yes. I said, is it fresh fruit? She said, it's not fresh but it's fruit. When I came to New York to study with Adolph Weiss and Henry Cowell, I took a job in Brooklyn, YWCA, washing walls. There was one other wall washer. He was more experienced than I. He told me how many walls to wash per day. In this way, he checked my original enthusiasm with the result that I spent a great deal of time simply reading the old newspapers, which I used to protect the floors. Thus, I had always to be, so to speak, on my toes, ready to resume scrubbing the moment I heard the housekeeper approaching. One room finished, I was to go to the next, but before entering any room, I was to look in the keyhole to see whether the occupant's key was in it on the inside. If I saw no key, I was to assume the room empty, go in, and set to work. One morning, called to the office, I had been told I was accused of peeking through the keyholes. I no sooner began to defend myself than I was interrupted. The housekeeper said that each year the wall washer, no matter who he was, was so accused, always by the same lady. Before studying Zen, men are men, and mountains are mountains. While studying Zen, things become confused. After studying Zen, men are men, and mountains are mountains. After telling this, Dr. Suzuki was asked, what is the difference 
between before and after. He said, no difference. Only the feet are a little bit off the ground. Mr. Romanoff is in the mushroom class. He is a pharmacist and takes color slides of the fungi we find. It was he who picked up a mushroom I brought to the first meeting of the class at the new school, smelled it, and said, has anyone perfumed this mushroom? Lois Long said, I don't think so. With each plant, Mr. Romanoff's pleasure is, as one might say, like that of a child. However, now and then children come on the field trips and they don't show particular delight over what is found. They try to attract attention to themselves. Mr. Romanoff said the other day, life is the sum total of all the little things that happen. Mr. Nearing smiled. Tucker Natterwick is 17 years old. He is a long son by her first husband. It was dinner time. He came home from his job in the Good Samaritan Hospital in Suffolk and said to his mother, well, dear, I won't be seeing you for a couple of days. Lois Long said, what's up? Tucker said, tomorrow night after work, I'm driving to Albany with Danny Sherwood for a cup of coffee, and I'll be back for work the following day. Lois Long said, for heaven's sake, you can have a cup of coffee here at home. Tucker Madwick replied, don't be a square. Read Kerouac. Merce Cunningham's parents were going to Seattle to see their other son, Jack. Mrs. Cunningham was driving. Mr. Cunningham said, don't you think you should go a little slower? You'll get caught. He gave this warning several times. Finally, on the outskirts of Seattle, they were stopped by a policeman. He asked to see Mrs. Cunningham's license. She rummaged around in her bag and said, I just don't seem to be able to find it. He then asked to see the registration. She looked for it, but unsuccessfully. The officer then said, Well, what are we going to do with you? Mrs. Cunningham started the engine. Before she drove off, she said, I just don't have any more time to waste talking with you. Goodbye. <coughs> I went to hear Krishnamurti speak. He was lecturing on how to hear a lecture. He said, you must pay full attention to what is being said. And you can't do that if you take notes. The lady on my right was taking notes. The man on her right nudged her and said, don't you hear what he's saying? You're not supposed to take notes. She then read what she had written and said, that's right. I have it written down, right here in my notes. Virgil Thompson and Maurice Grosser were driving across the United States. When they came to Kansas, Virgil Thompson said, drive as fast as possible. In no case, stop. Keep on going until we get out of it. Maurice Grocer got hungry and insisted on stopping for lunch. Seeing something at the end of the counter, he asked what it was. 
and the waitress replied, peanut butter pie. Virgil Thompson said, you see what I mean? One of Miles Van Der Rohe's pupils, a girl, came to him and said, I have difficulty studying with you because you don't leave any room for self-expression. her whether she had a pen with her. She did. He said, sign your name. She did. He said, that's what I call self-expression. During my last year in high school, I found out about the liberal Catholic church. It was in a beautiful spot in the Hollywood Hills. The ceremony was an anthology of the most theatrical bits and pieces found in the principal rituals, Occidental and Oriental. There were clouds of incense, candles galore, processions in and around the church. I was fascinated, and though I had been raised in the Methodist Episcopal Church and had had thoughts of going into the ministry, I decided to join the liberal Catholics. Mother and dad objected strenuously. Ultimately, when I told them of my intention to become an acolyte active in the mass, they said, well, make up your mind. It's us or the church. Thinking along the lines of, leave your father and mother and follow me, I went to the priest, told him what had happened, and said I'd decided in favor of the liberal Catholics. He said, don't be a fool, go home. There are many religions. You have only one mother and father. Suzuki's class who said once I have great difficulty reading the sermons of Meister Eckhart because of all the Christian imagery Dr. Suzuki said that difficulty will disappear. Schoenberg always complained that his American pupils didn't do enough work. There was one girl in his class, in particular, who, it is true, did almost no work at all. He asked her one day why she didn't accomplish more. She said, I don't have any time. He said, how many hours are there in the day? She said, 24. He said, nonsense. There are as many hours in a day as you put into it. One Sunday morning. Mother said to dad, let's go to church. Dad said, okay. When they drove up in front, dad showed no sign of getting out of the car. Mother said, 
Aren't you coming in? Dad said... No. I'll wait for you here. Alex and Gretchen Carrazzo gave a great deal of thought to whether or not they would attend the funeral of a close friend. At the last minute, they decided they would go. Hurriedly, they dressed, rushed out of the house, arrived late. The services had begun. They took seats at the back of the chapel. When the invitation came to view the body, they again deliberated, finally deciding to do so. Coming to the casket, they discovered they were at the wrong funeral. Xenia told me once that when she was a child in Alaska, she and her friends had a club. And there was only one rule. No silliness. Xenia never wanted a party to end. Once in Seattle, when the party we were at was folding, she invited those who were still awake, some of whom we'd only met that evening, to come over to our house. Thus it was that about 3 a.m., an Irish tenor was singing loudly in our living room. Manus Graves, who had a suite down the hall, entered ours without knocking, wearing an old-fashioned nightshirt and carrying an elaborately made wooden birdcage, the bottom of which had been removed. Making straight for the tenor, Graves placed the birdcage over his head, said nothing, and left the room. The effect was that of snuffing out a candle. Shortly, Xenia and I were alone. One day, while I was composing, the telephone rang. A lady's voice said, Is this John Cage, the percussion composer? I said, Yes. She said, This is the J. Walter Thompson Company. I don't know what that was, but she explained that their business was advertising. She said, Hold on. One of our directors wants to speak to you. During a pause, my mind went back to my composition. Then suddenly, a man's voice said, Mr. Cage, are you willing to prostitute your art? I said, yes. He said, well, bring us some samples Friday at 2. I did. After hearing a few recordings, one of the directors said to me, wait a minute. Then seven directors formed what looked like a football huddle. From this, one of them finally emerged, came over to me and said, you're too good for us. We're going to save you for Robinson Caruso. In the poetry contest in China, by which the sixth patriarch of Zen Buddhism was chosen there, were two poems. One said, the mind, like a mirror, it collects dust. The problem is to remove the dust. The other winning poem was actually
actually a reply to the first. It said, where is the mirror? And where is the dust? Some centuries later, in a Japanese monastery, there was a monk who was always taking baths. A younger monk came up to him and said, why, if there is no dust, are you always taking baths? The older monk replied, just a dip, no why. Merce Cunningham's father delights in gardening. Each year, he has had to move the shrubs back from the driveway to protect them from being run over when Mrs. Cunningham backs out. One day, Mrs. Cunningham, in backing out, knocked down, but did not hurt an elderly gentleman who had been taking a stroll. Getting out of her car and seeing him, lying on the sidewalk, Mrs. Cunningham said, What are you doing there? One day, I went to the dentist. Over the radio, they said it was the hottest day of the year. However, I was wearing a jacket because going to a doctor has always struck me as a somewhat formal occasion. In the midst of his work, Dr. Heyman stopped and said, why don't you take your jacket off? I said, I have a hole in my shirt and that's why I have my jacket on. He said, well, I have a hole in my sock, and if you like, I'll take my shoes off. During recent years, Daisetsu Tetero Suzuki has done a great deal of lecturing at Columbia University. First, he was in the Department of Religion, then somewhere else. Finally, he settled down on the seventh floor of Philosophy Hall. The room had windows on two sides, a large table in the middle with ashtrays. There were chairs around the table and next to the walls. These were always filled with people listening, and there were generally a few people standing near the door. The two or three people who took the class for credit sat in chairs around the table. The time was four to seven. During this period, most people now and then took a little nap. Suzuki never spoke loudly. When the weather was good, the windows were open and the airplanes leaving LaGuardia flew directly overhead from time to time, drowning out whatever he had to say. He never repeated what had been said during the passage of the airplane. Three lectures, I remember in particular. While he was giving them, I couldn't for the life of me figure out what he was saying. It was a week or so later, while I was walking in the woods looking for mushrooms, that it all dawned on me. George Mantor had an iris garden, which he improved each year by throwing out the commoner varieties. One day, his attention was called to another very fine iris garden. Jealously, he made some inquiries. The garden 
it turned out, belonged to the man who collected his garbage. One day, when I was studying with Schoenberg, he pointed out the eraser on his pencil and said, this end is more important than the other. After 20 years, I learned to write directly in ink. Recently, when David Tudor returned from Europe, he brought me a German pencil of modern make. It can carry any size of lead, pressure on a shaft at the end of the holder, freeze the lead so that it can be retracted or extended or removed and another put in its place. A sharpener came with the pencil. The sharpener offers not one but several possibilities. That is, one may choose the kind of point he wishes. There is no eraser. M.C. Richards went to see the Bolshoi Ballet. She was delighted with the dancing. She said, it's not what they do, it's the ardor with which they do it. I said, yes, composition, performance, and audition or observation are really different things. They have next to nothing to do with one another. Once I told her, I was at a house on Riverside Drive where people were invited to be present at a Zen service conducted by a Japanese Roshi. He did the ritual, rose petals and all. Afterwards, tea was served with rice cookies. And then the hostess and her husband, employing an out-of-tune piano and a cracked voice, gave a wretched performance of an excerpt from a third-rate Italian opera. I was embarrassed and glanced toward the Roshi to see how he was taking it. The expression on his face was absolutely beatific. When Sophie and I came to New York from Chicago, we arrived in the bus station with about 25 cents. We were expected to stay for a while with Peggy Guggenheim and Max Ernst. Max Ernst had met us in Chicago and had said, Whenever you come to New York, come and stay with us. We have a big house on the East River. I went to the phone booth in the bus station, put a nickel, and dialed. Max Ernst answered. He didn't recognize my voice. Finally, he said, are you thirsty? I said, yes. He said, well, come over tomorrow for cocktails. I went back to Xenia and told her what had happened. She said, call him back. We have everything to gain and nothing to lose. I did. Oh, it's you, he said. We've been waiting for you for weeks. Your room is ready. Come right over. Dad is an inventor. In 1912, his submarine had the world's record for staying underwater. Running as it did by means of a gasoline engine, it left bubbles on the surface, so it was not employed during World War I. Dad says he does his best work when he is sound asleep. I was explaining at the new school that the way to get ideas is to do something boring. For instance, composing in such a way that the process of composing is boring induces ideas. They fly into one's head like birds. Is that what Dad meant? One day, when I was across the hall visiting Sonia Sekula, I noticed that she was painting left-handed. I said, Sonia, aren't you right-handed? She said, yes, but I might lose the use of my right hand. And so I'm using, practicing using my left. I laughed and said, what if you lose the use of both hands? She was busy painting and didn't bother to reply. Next day, when I visited her, 
She was sitting on the floor, painting with difficulty, for she was holding the brush between two toes of her left foot. Morris Graves introduced Xenia and me to a miniature island in Puget Sound at Deception Pass. To get there, we traveled from Seattle about 75 miles north and west to Anacortes Island, then south to the pass where we parked. We walked along a rocky beach and then across a sandy stretch that was passable only at low tide to another island, continuing through some luxuriant woods up a hill where now and then we had views of the surrounding waters and distant islands until finally we came to a small footbridge that led to our destination, an island no larger than, say, a modest home. This island was carpeted with bowers and was so situated that all of Deception Pass was visible from it, just as though we were in the best seats of an intimate theater. While we were lying there on that bed of bowers, some other people came across the footbridge. One of them said to another, you come all this way and then when you get there, there's nothing to see. A composer friend of mine who spent some time in a mental rehabilitation center was encouraged to do a good deal of bridge play. After one game, his partner was criticizing his play of an ace on a trick, which had already been won. My friend stood up and said, if you think I came to the loony bin, to learn to play bridge, you're crazy. Richard Lippold called up and said, would you come to dinner and bring the I Ching? I said I would. It turned out he'd written a letter to the Metropolitan proposing that he be commissioned for a certain figure to do the sun. This letter withheld nothing about the excellence of his art, and so he hesitated to send it, not wishing to seem presumptuous. Using the coin oracle, we consulted the I Ching. I me it mentioned a letter. Advice to send it was given. Success was promised, but the need for patience was mentioned. A few weeks later, Richard Lippold called to say that his proposal had been answered, but without commitment, and that that should make clear to me, as it did to him, what to think of the I Ching. A year passed. The Metropolitan Museum finally commissioned the son. Richard Lippold still does not see eye to eye with me on the subject of chance operations. until the extra passenger was put off. She went and fetched the driver, who also asked, all right, who was the last person to get on the bus? Again, there was public silence. So the two went to find an inspector. He asked, who was the last person to get on the bus? No one spoke. He then announced that he would fetch a policeman. While the conductor's driver and inspector were away looking for a policeman, a little man came up to the bus stop and asked, is this the buck to Starport? Hearing that it was, he got on. A few minutes later, the three returned accompanied by a policeman. He asked, 
What seems to be the trouble? Who was the last person to get on the bus? The little man said, I was. The policeman said, all right, get off. All the people on the bus burst into laughter. The conductress, thinking they were laughing at her, burst into tears and said she refused to make the trip to Stockport. The inspector then arranged for another conductress to take over. She, seeing the little man standing at the bus stop, said, what are you doing here? He said, I'm waiting to go to Stockport. She said, well, this is the bus to Stockport. Are you getting on or not? When Vera Williams first noticed that I was interested in wild mushrooms, she told her children not to touch any of them because they were all deadly poisonous. A few days later, she bought a steak at Martino's and decided to serve it smothered with mushrooms. When she started to cook the mushrooms, the children all stopped whatever they were doing and watched her attentively. When she served the dinner, they all burst into tears. Standing in line, Max Jacob said, gives one the opportunity Practice patience. Dorothy Nanan invited me to dinner in New York. There was a lady there from Philadelphia who was an authority on Buddhist art. When she found out I was interested in mushrooms, she said, Have you an explanation of the symbolism involved in the death of the Buddha by his eating a mushroom? I explained that I'd never been interested in symbolism, that I preferred just taking things as themselves, not as standing for other things. But then a few days later, when rambling in the woods, I got to thinking and recalled the Indian concept of the relation of life and the seasons. Spring is creation, summer is preservation, fall is destruction, winter is quiescence. Mushrooms grow most vigorously in the fall, the period of destruction, and the function of many of them is to bring about the final decay of rotting material. In fact, as I read somewhere, the world would be an impassable heap of old rubbish were it not for mushrooms and their capacity to get rid of it. So I wrote to the lady in Philadelphia, I said, the function of mushrooms is to rid the world of old rubbish. The Buddha died a natural death. On Christmas Day. Mother said, I've listened to your records several times. After hearing all those stories about your childhood, I keep asking myself, where was it that I failed? An Indian lady invited me to dinner and said Dr. Suzuki would be there. He was. Before dinner, I mentioned Gertrude Stein. Suzuki had never heard of her. I described aspects of her work, which she had said sounded very interesting. Stimulated, I mentioned James Joyce, whose name was also new to him. At dinner, he was unable to eat the curries that were offered, so a few uncooked vegetables and fruits were brought, which he enjoyed. After dinner, the talk turned to metaphysical problems. 
and there were many questions, for the hostess was a follower of a certain Indian yogi, and her guests were more or less equally divided between allegiance to Indian thought and to Japanese thought. About 11 o'clock, we were out on the street walking along, and an American lady said, How is it, Dr. Suzuki? We spend the evening asking you questions and nothing is decided. Dr. Suzuki smiled and said, That's why I love philosophy. No one wins. I went to a concert upstairs in Town Hall. The composer, whose works were being performed, had provided program notes. One of these notes was to the effect that there is too much pain in the world. After the concert, I was walking along with the composer, and he was telling me how the performances had not been quite up to snuff. So I said, well, I enjoyed the music, but I didn't agree with that program note about there being too much pain in the world. He said, what? Don't you think there's enough? I said, I think there's just the right amount. The question of leading tones came up in the class in experimental composition that I give at the new school. I said, you surely aren't talking about ascending half steps in diatonic music. Is it not true that anything leads to whatever follows? But the situation is more complex. For things also lead backwards in time. This also does not give a picture that corresponds with reality. For it is said, the Buddha's enlightenment penetrated in every direction to every point in space and time. In Zen, they say, if something is boring after two minutes, Try it for four. If still boring, try it for eight. Sixteen. Thirty-two. And so on. Eventually, one discovers that it's not boring at all but very interesting. After a long and arduous journey, a young Japanese man arrived deep in a forest where the teacher of his choice was living in a small house he had made. When the student arrived, the teacher was sweeping up fallen leaves. Greeting his master, the young man received no greeting in return, and to all his questions there were no replies. Realizing there was nothing he could do to get the teacher's attention, the student went to another part of the same forest and built himself a house. Years later, when he was sweeping up fallen leaves, he was enlightened. He then dropped everything, ran through the forest to his teacher and said, thank you. One spring morning, I knocked on Sonia Sekula's door. She lived across the hall. Presently, 
The door was opened, just a crack. And she said, quickly, I know you're very busy. I won't take a minute of your time.